Last week, we started a brand new series called This is Hard, and it's all about change. It's about really embracing change because the fact is that staying the same simply isn't an option. We talked about how God wants to work change in your life. God, in fact, wants to change you. Maybe better stated, God wants to grow you. And oftentimes, that growth that he wants to cause to happen in you requires change, right? Well, that can be scary because change oftentimes um, is something that we didn't ask for, right? Sometimes uh, it looks like stuff that you don't really want to change, you know? So as I was kind of picturing this as I was making my way through the week, I was thinking about um, this relationship we have with God and oftentimes how we approach it like we would a uh, negotiation. Like, I don't know if you've ever had like one of those horror stories where you thought you were buying a car for a particular price and then they bring you into this other room and they tell you all these other things you have to pay for and then you realize, oh, I get to negotiate all sorts of stuff in here. I live for those moments, but most people do not, right? Like, I, like it is my dream to be in that, like right across from like, the finance manager and be like, I will walk out of here right now. You know what I mean? Like some of you guys are like, oh, he's that guy. Yeah. I am, all right? But I feel like many times we approach our relationship with God in that way. Like, we'll sit down at the table, all right, God, thank you for Jesus. You've heard the gospel, right? You know the good news of Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection. You believe all of that. And then you realize God wants to go to work in your life because some preacher has the audacity to tell you that he doesn't want to leave you the way that you are. And so you go to this table with the finance manager, which of course is God in this particular, which those of you who are finance managers are like, oh, finally. Anyway, so there's God across the table. And you say, all right, God, here's here's where I'm okay with you going to work. There are some parts of my life that even I realize aren't going the way they're supposed to. Like, I'm kind of outside of your will in a few places. There are some rough edges, and so I'm going to write down a few things. I'm going to pass this across the table, and I just want you to take a look at these areas and tell me if you'd be willing to go to work in these areas. And because God is patient and kind and merciful, I think God takes that list and he looks at it, and he probably doesn't immediately burst into laughter, but he's, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, dude, I, I've got so much more in store for you. Like, there's so much more I have in mind. If you will give me access to everything and not make a list of the things that you give me access to, I want to grow you. I want to change you. Right? There are some areas that you didn't include on this list because you don't think that changing those areas could do you any good. I, I tell you what, if you'll trust me in those areas, let me mess with your stuff just a little bit. Trust me, on the other side, you're going to be thankful that you did. But it's scary because we recognize that change can be painful, right? But if you're willing to become a child of God, if you're willing to accept the sacrifice of Jesus, the salvation that is offered, then God's promise is that he then gives you a counselor, his own spirit, God himself in the spirit, living with you, living inside of you. And when he shows up, he goes to work. As we mentioned last week, he invites you into this dance. He wants to do it together. But his commitment is that he is going to work with you until he's finished. We saw that in this particular verse Paul wrote to the Philippians last week. Paul says, I am sure of this, friends, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is the commitment that God makes. If, if you let me put my spirit in you, he is going to work in you until he is finished. And he's working in you. This is just a spoiler alert. This is all we're talking about this morning. He is working in you to change you and to grow you to be more like Jesus. That is his greatest aim in having access to your heart, in having access to your life, in working and changing and growing you, is that you would become more like Jesus. I know that because Paul wrote in Romans 8, 39, or 29, he said this. He said, for those that God foreknew, he also predestined. And we aren't going to talk great length about predestination today because that's like eight sermons. And I promise we will discuss that, okay? We will do that. But just let's go with me for a second. He, he, he knew them. He predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. Here's what you need to understand. If you have come to a saving faith in Jesus, you recognize that this good news is in fact good news for you. And you have accepted that salvation then God's desire for you is to be conformed to the image of his son so that Jesus would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He's building a family. He is building a family, the family of God, but it has everything to do with his design for your heart, your character, and everything about you to become more like Jesus. So that begs the question, like, what does it mean to become more like Jesus, right? If we were to ask anybody that question, there's going to be a variety of answers. Some of the answers, I think, go like this, that, that has something to do with our morality. That to become more like Jesus would mean to, to live a more moral life, 
right? You can look at all sorts of different passages of Scripture in which the Bible emphasizes the righteousness of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ. He is the unblemished Lamb of God that paid for our sin. And so, to some extent, yes, that to become more like Jesus would mean for our life to, to be less sinful, that that's part of what it means to be more like Jesus. Oftentimes, people will stress the fact that Jesus came with a very clear sense of mission, that he knew why God sent him to earth, and that to be like Jesus would be to embrace the fact that we live our lives on mission. And so we look at the Great Commission. We look at Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, where he gives us this incredible job description of being an ambassador, making a plea to the world around us to be reconciled to God. And that's what it means to be like Jesus. Others will look at the intimate relationship that Jesus had with his father whether those are the different prayers where he would get away early in the morning or the John 17 prayer where even before he was led away to be crucified, he's having this heart-to-heart with his father, this direct line of communication where he knew God and God knew him. And so we think in our minds to be like Christ would be to have that kind of intimacy with God. I want to add two words to this that I think are also true of what it means to bite with Jesus, and those are surrender and submission. Simply put, I think if we read the story of Jesus, if we read the biographies that are given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we will see in Christ is the perfect example of a human life, now understanding he wasn't just human, but the perfect example of a life that was fully surrendered to the will of God, fully submitted to God's thoughts, fully submitted to God's plans and to God's purposes right? That that is what Jesus did. His morality, his mission, the intimacy was all a product of him being fully surrendered and submitted. It's this kind of mindset where it says, God, everything that I have is yours. I think this way, you think that way. I'm going to put my thoughts in submission to yours so that you get your way. It's what we see in John 17, where he's having this heart to heart with his father. And he's like, hey, father, If you want to come up with a different way of like, you know, figuring out this whole sin problem, and I don't have to actually die this gruesome death on the cross, I'm all ears, right? And I'm giving you the Nathan paraphrase because you know the prayer I'm talking about. Yet not my will, but your will be done. This submission to the will of God is what we see personified in Christ from the day he was born until the day he was taken back to heaven. I think Paul figured this out a little bit too. Now, I don't think Paul was a perfect example by any means, but I think Paul figured out that this was the best way to live because it allowed him in his letter to the Galatians to write this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is saying, listen, I've figured out my life isn't about me. Right? I died to my old ways of living so that I could experience this new eternal life of purpose with God. And so in light of everything he's done for me, I'm going to give everything that I have back to him. Right? Ultimately, to be like Jesus is to know and live out the perfect will of God. To know and live out the perfect will of God. That's what it means to be like Jesus. So it begs the question. How does God do this? If God's commitment is that he goes to work and he grows us and he makes us more Jews, how does that particular phenomenon happen? Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul writes uh, a great letter to the Romans. We've already mentioned chapter 8. We're going to look at chapter 12 a little bit. And we're going to look at two verses that you know if you've grown up in church. It's actually a little daunting to teach these two verses because as soon as I put them up there, you're going to be like, oh, I know what those are. I know exactly what he's talking about. Like, this is very easy. I could preach this sermon, which, by the way, if you want to, here's the clicker. Okay? Come on up. Let's do it. Some of you guys are, like, thinking about it. All right? So, uh, Brad, not right now. All right? Let's not do that. Colton, you back there. All right, well, we'll talk about it afterwards. We can debrief. All right? But here's the thing. I believe that in these verses, in Romans chapter 12, see, Paul does this incredible job for eight chapters of Romans to make this deep theological um, argument, uh, trying to convince the the Roman church and and really solidify their faith and, and show them everything that God has done. And then 9 through 11, he kind of talks about the nuances of what it means to be saved and how that works with the Israelites of old and the old covenant and how he wants to graft these two branches together and how there's this new kingdom that he's trying to create. But then in Romans 12, it takes another turn, and this is more of the practical application. This is like your basic sermon, right, where there's a, a lot of theology up front, and then at the very end, it's like, here's what you do in light of everything that you just learned. Paul writes this letter the exact same way. 
And so in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says this. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, in light of everything I've written for 11 chapters so far, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, or your translation might say to the patterns of this world, to the culture at hand, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God, right? This is a call from Paul to a a type of wholehearted devotion to God, a rejection of the ways of the world, the, the patterns of the world, the way the world is kind of currently going, He's emphasizing the importance of spiritual transformation or spiritual growth, right? Which starts with a renewed mind or a way of thinking about things and seeing things differently that ultimately leads us to a place where, like Jesus, we can know and follow the will of God. You see, I think these two verses are all about spiritual growth. I think these two verses are all about God's aim in in growing us and making us more like Christ. Let's look at a couple of the different phrases, right? The first thing I want you to see is when he says, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you, right? This word urge, obviously the English translation of a Greek word, but the word that it's translating isn't ask. He's not saying, I ask of you. He's not saying, I suggest. He's not saying, here's an idea, he is pleading with you. He's begging you, do this, right? In fact, there's a, there's a nuance to this particular word that, that it, um, almost describes the proximity of the person making this request. In other words, the idea that's kind of wrapped up in, in all of the nuances of the Greek word is that this is somebody that's not standing on a stage making a plea to a crowd. It'd be like me getting down and going face to face with Drew and looking him eye to eye and saying, Drew, I urge you. I mean, how powerful is it for one of your closest friends or somebody to come and look you eye to eye and say, listen, this is so important. Believe me, I want you to do this. This is the best thing you can do. In in light of everything that Paul had experienced, in light of all of the things that he had just told them that God did for them, he is making this urging plea, begging them to do this one thing. And of course, the reason he's begging them to do it or the reason that he thinks they should do it is in view of the mercies of God. I'm begging you to do this in light of the fact that God has been kind and patient and forgiving, in light of the way that he has made a way for you to escape the kingdom of darkness and be relocated into a kingdom of light, to be taken off a path that leads to destruction and put on a brand new road that leads to joy and purpose and meaning and life everlasting. In view of everything that God has given you that you didn't deserve, I am making this plea. And of course, the plea is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, when he says bodies, he's not physically talking about just your physical body. He's saying your whole self. I I ask that you would would present or offer to God your whole self. Everything that is yours. All of the possessions you have. All of the resources you have. Every blessing you've been given, I ask you to give it back to God. And I ask you to give it back to God as a living sacrifice. Now, that particular phrase, that's a unique phrase. That is not a common phrase in first century Roman culture. All right? They're very familiar with a sacrifice. Obviously, if they grew up in the Jewish understanding or the Jewish faith, they understood sacrifice from kind of an old covenant understanding. But there were other pagan religion things around there that practiced sacrifice. Some of them even practiced child sacrifice. I mean, they understood what sacrifice is, and typically their understanding of sacrifice is something is either dead before it's offered, or it dies as a part of the process of being offered. So when Paul says to them, I want you to offer your body as a living sacrifice, what he's saying is, God has allowed you to experience a new kind of life that will be an ongoing life, eternally speaking, And as you have been given the opportunity to continue living according to this new kingdom, your best response, the best option you have, is to have an ongoing process of surrendering and submitting every day, every part of you, back to God. It's waking up in the morning and saying, I get another day to live. God, this day is yours. And then you go to bed, and you wake up the next day and say, guess what? I get another day to live. God, today, this Sunday, is yours. And tomorrow, Monday, it's yours. 
And so it's this ongoing commitment that, that Paul is urging us to make to turn everything our life in our life back over to God. It's dedicating our whole self. It's not just outward rituals. It's not what just people see on the outside. It's certainly not just like simple acts of service that we like to offer here and there. One of my very favorite preachers of all time is a guy named Dr. Tony Evans. He's in Dallas, Fort Worth. The guy knows theology. He's an amazing communicator. You should listen to him more than you listen to me. Like podcast the guy, seriously. He's unbelievable. But as I was studying for this week and I'm listening and reading things that Tony Evans has used to kind of teach this because he's better than me, he uses this incredible metaphor that I'm sure is not unique to him. He talks about presenting your whole self as a living sacrifice using the metaphor of what a chicken and a pig bring to a bacon and egg breakfast. You may have heard this before, but think about it. If you're going to have a breakfast of bacon and eggs, a chicken and a pig have both been involved, right? Now, the chicken makes a nice contribution, right? I'm sure there's something painful about, you know, laying an egg. I don't know. I've never been a chicken before, but I can't imagine it's like the best thing ever. So there's probably a little bit of sacrifice, a little discomfort associated with it. But you know what? Like the chicken, you know, pops out a couple eggs or whatever and then goes on about the chicken's way. But the pig, the pig's all in, right? That's full sacrifice. That's it. That's all of it. And so I think what we often try to do is we try and, and, and take the role of a chicken, where we're offering a, an egg here and there. Hey, hey, God, I'm going to do this for you. Hey, God, guess what? I'm going to do this for you. Hey, God, guess what? That part of my life that I didn't want to give you before, yeah, I'm going to give you that one now. Yeah, we're not going to talk about those other ones. I'm holding back for myself. We take the chicken's posture where we just want to offer certain things. We see God's kind of calling us to be the pig, or at least Paul's urging us to be the pig to be all in, to be fully sacrificed. In fact, what Paul says here is that if you offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because that's the only way you can please God is you give him all of yourself, then what it turns out to be is true worship. That anything short of full submission isn't really true worship. Right? We talk about worship, and oftentimes our, our minds immediately go to, to um, like a church service or, or music, right? Like, I went to a worship service today, or I'm listening to worship music today, or whatever. And, and I'm not going to tell you that that's like the, the world's worst thing, because it's certainly not. But worship is anything and everything you do to kind of show God where he fits into your life. And you worship what you give yourself to, to be perfectly honest. So if everything in you is giving yourself to your husband or your wife, you're worshiping your husband and your wife. If everything about you is being given to your job, you're worshiping your job. And what Paul is saying here is like what true worship looks like to God, the kind that's holy and pleasing to him, is when you offer everything in your life, access to every corner of your heart to him, right? That's what total surrender looks like. And I think practically speaking, it kind of looks like this. It looks like a prayer that says, God, as I sit across the table from you, there's nothing off limits. You can have my finances. You can have my time. You can have my vocation. My sex life, yeah, I used to do that my way because it seemed more fun than your way, to be perfectly honest with you. But you know what, God? I'm going to trust you so you can have that now. God, you can have my family. You can have my hobbies. You can have my likes and dislikes, right? I was using this in the, in the first service. I think it's great. Like, imagine my, you know, God in, in whatever supernatural way he wants to do it, a vision, a dream, or whatever, comes to my wife and leads her to believe, and she's fully convinced, and she's run it through her filters and all those kind of things, that God's will for her life is to start volunteering at the local zoo in the snake habitat, you know? Now, my wife immediately is going to react like, absolutely not! She hates snakes. She's terrified. You know, like even the friendly ones that you should never kill, she's like, kill that! You know, I mean, like, I've never seen this murderous spirit unlike my wife with, like, the smallest, like, that's not even a snake, honey, it's a worm. It's a worm! It's not even a snake! But like, here's, I, do we not do that? Do we not say, God, I want to give you all of me. And he's like, okay, I got an idea. How about this? I don't really like that. What I really like is this. He's like, yeah, we're going to talk about that thing. You actually probably spend a little too much time doing that thing you really like. And listen, that's not to say that there are things that are written into your heart that God created uniquely to be passionate about, to find joy and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think God wants to rob you of that joy or take away things that are really important to you for no reason whatsoever. I think, honestly, if God ever comes to you and wants to, like, you stop doing something or, or impress it on your heart that maybe you should um, consider doing less of something that really brings you joy, it's because he, in his infinite wisdom, knows there's actually something else you could be doing that's even better. 
I truly believe that. But how many of us come to God and say, hey, God, listen, I'll give some of my money to you. Cool. I get that. I understand how that's part of obedience. I understand how that's part of, like, investing in your kingdom. I understand that's part of, like, what it means to be a part of a local church. All right? But, like, the rest of my money, I'm going to spend my way. Or else I say, hey, God, listen, I got 10 hours a week that I'm going to devote to community service and my church and small group and things like that. But every other hour of the week, I'm going to spend those hours my way. When Paul is urging them to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, he's saying, sit down and say, God, all my money is yours. And so part of that money I'm going to invest back in your kingdom. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to support my local church. That's what it means to be a part of the family of God. And there's a ministry or a missionary that I really feel passionate about, so I'm going to give some of that too. But there's, there's quite a bit left over. And guess what? God, I want to know what you think about how I spend, invest, and save the rest of that too. It's not just about me doing what I want with this stuff because I've already kind of been generous in these other areas. It's about saying, God, you have all of me. And I, I'm going to run every part of my life through the filter of what you would have. Right? As he continues in verse 2, we kind of break it down. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This difference between conformed by the world and transformed by God. And it's ultimately saying, you've got a choice. We all have this choice. What I love is he's saying, once you've offered yourself as a living sacrifice to God, once you've offered yourself to God, your relationship with the world is fundamentally altered forever, or it should be. Right? Like, there should be a difference between the way that a, a growing Christian sees and thinks about the world and people who haven't come into a relationship with Christ and don't have the mind of Christ that he describes elsewhere. That there should be, like, a tangible, noticeable difference in the way that we treat other people because we see them differently than our neighbor sees them. Right? It's like the, 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 the great picture would be, like, three houses on a block. And like the house in the middle is just loud and they don't mow their yard and they don't do all sorts of things. And one side neighbor is a Christian and one side neighbor is not. There should be a difference in the way that those neighbors kind of interact with the house in the middle based on the fact that we have offered ourselves to God and our minds are being transformed to think the way that God thinks about them. You see, both of these commands are passive. In other words, we aren't doing the forming. Like we aren't conforming, we aren't transforming, that's being done by someone else or something else. The struggle is real, friends. I mean, there's this tug of war going on at all times. And by the way, if you think that's not true and you're forming all your own opinions and all your own ideas and all, like, what do they say in the South? God bless you. Is that what it says, right? I mean, that's like the backhanded compliment or something. Like, I mean, let's just, let's just be real. None of us chooses how we believe about things. All of our opinions, all of our ideas, all of our feelings have been formed by something outside of us. Now, we do work, we, 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 you know, we fight back and forth, we consider the sides and all that. I, I get all that. But there are so many forces at work outside of our heart and mind, working on our heart and mind, that we should just acknowledge the fact that we're either going to be transformed or we're going to be conformed. And we decide which one we allow to do the forming. Right? He says the renewing of our mind. That's what he says right here. Be transformed. Where does it start? By renewing our mind. The first thing that God is going to address is the way we think. It's our thoughts. It's our mind. He wants to merge our thoughts into his thoughts. He doesn't want to find compromise. It's like, hey, God, I think this way about something. And he's like, well, I think this way about something. Let's find a third way. No. What he does in spiritual growth is if you give him access... Your thoughts become more like his thoughts day after day after day. And you will recognize that because you will notice in your own heart, mind, opinion, and spirit that you start to see things a little bit differently than you used to. You start to think about things a little bit differently than you used to, right? And if you do that, if you allow him to renew your mind, then ultimately you will have this amazing gift that you'll be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This is what happens when you give him access to your mind, when you allow to him to do the transforming rather than conforming, when you allow him to have your attention and him to be the great source of all the input of the things that you're taking in, is that you become like Christ. You get to know and follow the will of God, a fully surrendered, fully submitted life. Now, if you allow this argument to keep going for one more verse, because I love this next verse, it says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think, this is kind of a, another practical application, 
all right? We're thinking, we're renewing our mind. Don't think of yourself more highly than you should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. And he's beginning to start to address some things that are happening in the church. As this continues from here, he talks about different gifts in the church, different roles in the church, and how there seems to be, like at least in the human mind, a hierarchy to certain gifts being better than the others, right? But what he's saying is that transformation begins in our mind. In another book, in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, if you just want to write it down, he talks about how there's going to be certain things that make sense to Christians that don't make sense to non-Christians because the Spirit allows us to understand certain things. What he says is we actually have the mind of Christ. That is what the Spirit is working to do, to give our mind the mind of Christ. He also says here not to think too highly about ourselves. In other words, there's no room for spiritual arrogance or pride. We should never think more of ourselves because of the gifts that we have or the way we're even able to live out obediently the call on our life in comparison to somebody else. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. It's the one that I reference all the time, where he gives this incredible job title of being an ambassador, making a plea to the world around us to be reconciled. But that particular passage starts with him saying, we no longer look at people the way the world looks at people. We no longer look at them with human eyes. We don't even see Jesus the way we used to see them, because the Spirit has opened our eyes and changed our mind, and we now see and think differently so that we see people as not being to be fixed. We see people who are in need of a Savior, and we trust that He's going to be the one that comes in and does the changing and the growing. People often ask all the time, how do I know that I'm growing in the faith? How do I know that I'm getting more spiritually mature, just growing spiritually? What does that look like? And I think there are some good answers, and we're going to give you those in, in the next couple of weeks. All right, so if you're gone to college, hop on YouTube. I mean, I think it'll be helpful, but I'll just give you this one. I think one of the greatest signs of spiritual growth is that you find yourself less and less thinking less of other Christians. Now, if that was confusing, it's because I didn't say it very well. As I mentioned before, Tony Evans, he's fantastic, all right? But when we think more highly of ourselves than we should, as Paul says, what that typically means is that we think less of somebody else. It's because their church is blacked out with smoke machines, and that's not near as holy as what we need to do in here with stained glass, right? It's because their church uses the King James or doesn't use the King James, and we do. It's because somebody else is in their stage of spiritual growth, and they haven't yet had their mind totally renewed. By the way, neither have we, but they still struggle with things that we seem to have kind of a grip on. And so we look in the mirror and we go, well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And one of the things that Paul is saying that you will recognize as a sign of your transformation and your renewed mind is that you will think sensibly and not think too highly of yourself. Spiritual arrogance has no place in the family of God. And one of the places that you can be sure to see growth, and I've seen this, friends, I have seen this, because there have been times when people have one particular understanding uh, of Scripture, and I look at the exact same verses, I was like, how could they get it that wrong? And I think to myself, well, they're just not as good a Christian as I am. Now, I know, nobody else has done that, all right? I'm the only one that struggles with pride and arrogance in the room. And so you're welcome for me being transparent. But all of us struggle with something. We all struggle with something. So Paul says a renewed mind thinks sensibly. It doesn't think more highly than it should. It understands that everyone has been given a gift. Everyone has been given faith. And God is at work in each and every one of us, right? So what is transformation? What does it look like? What is it going to take, right? Let me tell you real quickly, two things that transformation is not. It's not simply the accumulation of more biblical knowledge or theological knowledge. Like, I, I just don't think there's a real correlation because some of the people that know the Bible, like the best that I've watched, seen, read, look nothing like Christ and desire nothing to be like Christ. And some of the people that I know the Bible the best do look, in fact, a lot like Jesus. But there's not a direct correlation between just knowing theology and knowing the Bible and being more like Jesus. All right? we talked last week about um, Solomon, right? Given more wisdom in the world. And yet still somehow he winds up with like 900 women in his life. You know, I mean, like this guy... He has all the knowledge in the world, but it doesn't make him live a wise, discerning life. So it's not just simply the accumulation of knowledge. It's also not just behavior modification. In other words, if you're looking for evidence of spiritual growth, and it's just like, well, I'm just not doing all the bad things anymore. I am doing all the good things anymore. 
that's not just, that's not always a clear sign of spiritual growth. Here's a great example. Like, with um, incentives or enticing my son to do certain things with rewards or with threatening discipline or punishment, I can get even my 15-year-old son with autism to behave properly more often than not. And that's a miracle in and of itself. But I don't think that that's spiritual growth in his life. I think that's him saying, well, if I do this thing, dad's going to take away all the stuff I love. And if I do this thing, dad's going to take me to the Astros game. That's not spiritual growth. That's behavior modification. And I think oftentimes we confuse the accumulation of knowledge or the fact that we just act better with we've grown spiritually. But see, God isn't just about our actions. He's not just about our knowledge. He's about our heart and our character, right? True spiritual formation is an internal change. It's a mind, it's a heart thing that reflects the character of Christ and then brings about a corresponding external change. That's why just judging someone based on their external actions is probably the wrong thing to do. Because there are a lot of people that do a lot of the right things for the wrong reasons. There are a lot of people who do a lot of the right things with manipulative motives behind the fact. There are a lot of people who do wrong things that have a good heart, but they're just caught in the middle of a struggle, the tug of war of culture and God trying to transform their life. Simply reading a book by its cover, if you'll allow me one more metaphor, is probably not a great spiritual practice as you evaluate others or yourself. There's an internal change that, yes, shows itself in spiritual fruit, in great actions, in great decisions, in confidence, in sharing faith. And it requires our involvement, but we cannot transform ourselves. You can't study enough to grow. You can't memorize enough or write enough songs or sing enough songs to grow. It is the work of the Spirit in you doing that. Consider Romans 8.29 again. We're being conformed into the image of God, right? Which means the same image of Jesus. Spiritual growth looks like both our attitudes and our actions being more like Jesus, our character becoming more like him. And this is an ongoing struggle, right? This is hard because we're we're not static. We're we're ongoing in process. We talked about that last week. We use this idea that like five years ago, I'm somebody different than I am today. And we can all look at pictures from five years ago. Yeah, yeah, I'm different this way. You know, I've got two kids now or I'm 10 pounds heavier, 10 pounds lighter, less hair, whatever it might be. Like it's very easy for us to recognize that. But did you in fact know that if you were here last Sunday or wherever you were, formal coming back, whatever, you're a different person today than you were a week ago? Do you know that? You're different. There's something, it it may be hard to recognize, but you're slightly different. Everything you listened to this last week, everything you read, everything you ate, every conversation you had, had some ability to form you in a certain way. You're being conformed or transformed at all times, which is why it's worth asking when it comes to our mind and the things that shape our thoughts. Oftentimes, it's the media that we consume, right? The things that we watch, the things that we listen to, the things that we read that form our thoughts. Right? Like I, so here's the thing. Like I'm a podcaster. I don't know if you guys listen to podcasts, but like, if you listen to the daily podcast of Ben Shapiro or Alex Cooper or Joe Rogan or you know, Tucker Carlson, RIP, used to be you know, appointment television for you guys. You had to watch it every night because what's Tucker going to say tonight? This just in. Your mind is being formed by who you're listening to on a repetitive basis. You listen to the same voice enough and enough and enough. And, and here's the thing. I, I don't typically brag on myself, but I feel like I've gotten pretty good at this. I'm still struggling with it because I love me some gangster rap. But aside from that, okay, I do. I'm sorry, okay? Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. <laughs> but, like, I used to love, um, what's the guy's name? Financial peace dude, Dave Ramsey, right? right? I, I, you know, I kind of like his bravado and his whole thing. It's like, you're an idiot. Get out of debt. You know, whatever it was. I come to find, like, I am less like Jesus the more I listen to Dave Ramsey. Can I just say that? Like, maybe you're not. And this is an individual thing. Like, this is not me telling you to stop listening to any of these people. But I have to be honest with myself. The more I listen to Dave Ramsey, the madder I got. And you know what? There are a lot of podcasters and commentators and things that I agree with. But there's something in the way that they say the things that they believe that actually forms my character more than just the substance of what it is that they believe. And so I think we should be careful. If you don't believe me, I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine one day. You can't tell him that I said this in a sermon or he'll look it up on YouTube. 
But I'm telling you right now, we've been, we haven't lived in the same place for about five years now. Loves Jesus, loves Jesus. But if you were to meet him and have a conversation with him, you'd probably leave thinking, that guy right there is a disciple of Jordan Peterson. He loves Jordan. Like, listen, Jordan Peterson's brilliant. I'm not saying he's not. And there are a lot of things that Jordan Peterson says where I'm like, yeah, kind of an interesting dude. By the way, Canadian, if you've never heard of him before, like, don't, whatever. I mean, do it. I don't care, whatever. But like, his mind and his thoughts and his everything has very much been formed by what Jordan Peterson thinks, says, and argues. Like, you are, <laughs> you think like those that you allow to come in and input thoughts into your mind. And so this is going to take good judgment. It's worth asking for help. It's worth asking your spouse or your best friend. Hey, you know the shows that I watch. You know the music I listen to. You know that podcast. Like, here's the thing. I, I, I'm thinking about maybe cutting back on some of that stuff. Or maybe I'm just going to continue to listen to it a while. But if you can point out something in me that you think might be out of line with being transformed by the Spirit rather than being conformed to this you know, this influencer, this podcaster, the ways of the world. Like, I want you to point those things out. And if you think it'd be worth me maybe pressing pause or unsubscribing for certain things, like, I want to be open to that. Invite somebody into your life that can be honest with you and shape that and share that with you, right? It's going to be worth developing a filter where you, or a practice where you evaluate your habits. You evaluate your choices. You evaluate the media that you're consuming. I think at all times we should ask ourselves, like, this would be a very helpful practice. Am I becoming more like the world that I live in, or is my mind and heart becoming more like Jesus? And if it's not becoming more like Jesus, how can I posture myself, understanding I'm not doing the transforming work, but I can posture myself to give him the access to my life and to breathe in and to take in the things of him so that he can transform me and make me more like Jesus. And somebody's going to ask, well, why is this worth doing, especially if you're not a Christian? Like, what's the point in doing this. Why would Paul get face to face and say, I urge you to do this? It's because we're all being formed by something or someone at all times. We're all in the process of becoming something better or worse. And the truth is, we're being influenced to become that person. We typically don't choose that for ourselves. God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. I mentioned that last week. God loves you too much to not want access to all of you because in his mind, he knows what you look like when you are fully sanctified, set apart, and like Jesus. Now, I want to give you a warning because surrendering to the transformative power and access of God is the more difficult of those two options that I mentioned before. It is the harder road. It is always going to be harder to offer yourself to be transformed by God than to become formed by the world. And if I could use one more metaphor because I love doing that, let me just say, it's a whole lot easier to ride the waves than it is to make waves swimming upstream. It's always easier to get on your float and go down the river and just ride the waves than it is to recognize that this is where the current is taking me. And I believe God is heading in a different direction. And so I'm going to get out of this raft and I'm going to start paddling. I'm going to partner with him. He's pulling me that way. I'm going to go willingly. Right? Easy is appealing, but easy doesn't get you to where you want to go. I promise it doesn't get you to where you want to go. You will change. Like, you'll change. Like, 10 years from now, you'll think differently about something that the world says is right now because 10 years from now, the world is going to change its mind. Any of you that are, like, older than 30 know exactly what I'm talking about. Candidates that campaigned on one particular position 20 years later are campaigning, campaigning on the exact opposite. Why? Because the world changed its mind, how it believes about things. And if you ride the waves of the currents of the world, you will too. You will change. You just won't grow. You'll change. You just won't grow. Becoming a Christian allows God to be the one that's forming you. It allows you to be formed by the creator of the world who knows how it works, who knows how it will end, who knows you and loves you and knows that the best version of you is the one that looks more and more like Jesus every day. So the choice is yours. The choice is mine. The choice is ours. May we make a wise choice. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this passage of Scripture today. I thank you for, uh, for Paul's desire to make this face-to-face, eye-to-eye plea with the church in Rome. Right in the middle of, of cultural change, right in the middle of, of, of cultural influence, God, he is, he is telling them to live in that place, but not of that place. To be to, to, to reject and to push away from the currents and the waves of, of an ever-changing world and culture that they are living in. 
by fixing their eyes on you and becoming along as a willing partner in this transformation that begins with the renewing of our minds. So God, that's my simple prayer this morning, that we would make the choice to be transformed rather than conformed. God, that we would make the choice to posture ourselves as we, as we fix our gaze on you, that we would, we, would, we would seek your heart and your will. God, that you would, we would give you access to every area of our life, holding nothing back so that you might finish your work in us, making us more and more like Christ each and every day. God, this is hard. We need your help. Come alongside. Don't give up on us. Use us and make us into who you've created us to be. In Jesus' name I pray.